Welcome to She's a Full-On Monet, a digital lifestyle magazine for women. Every week, our editor-in-chief, Kelly Castillo, along with Megan Block and special guests, participate in a deep dive discussion about recent articles and topics we have covered. We invite you to become part of our community where everyone's welcome. Hi guys, welcome back to She's a Full on Monet, episode 15, week 15. Can't believe that. Um, so today we are going to be talking about uh, finances within the confines of a relationship. And um, especially, obviously, finances in a relationship where you live together, um, marriage, partners, uh, live in, whatever, and how that um, really can work and how it cannot work. Um, I know a lot of studies have shown that finances are one of the leading causes of divorce. So obviously, it's a sticky issue for a lot of people. And um, it's a very personal issue for a lot of people. So Um, Megan and I are going to talk to you guys about that today. Hi, Megan. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. This is a very interesting subject because yes, it is one of those heavy, hot button topics when you're in a relationship and navigating through it can sometimes be weird and be opposing, you know, you have different opinions on how you want to work it when the more together you guys become as a unit, you know, so it can be tricky and and it's always different for every couple, right? So right. it's an interesting subject for sure. I feel like it's a very individual topic because everybody's relationship is different and everybody's financial situation is different. Even within a relationship, the two people rarely have the same financial background and situation and also the same kind of spending habits and financial responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it varies so much from person to person that... Um, that it's a difficult subject to navigate because I mean, people's finances are something that is obviously very important to them and a very sensitive subject. Especially now, especially in the last few years when things have been so upside down wacky that even, even people that were so financial, financially secure are now somewhat winging it. And it's like, we're all, yeah, it's a sensitive subject, you know, cause we're all mm-hmm. just like, it, it in no way represents us as people, but sometimes we feel that way, especially when we're not like, it's not our biggest flex, so to speak. We're like, oh yeah, here you are. You know, it can, yeah. it can be daunting. I mean, personally, I, my husband and I have separate accounts. We don't, I don't know his finances very well and he doesn't know mine. Of course, now that's changed though, because we just recently um, were accepted into a place in Orange County and he needed the entire time we were going through the rental application process. He needed, you know, financial records. Like I gave him username and passwords to all of my finances and it felt uncomfortable because I was like, Oh, what is he going to think? Um, but sometimes there are moments in life in couples where like you're moving or you're trying to get a house or trying to get a place where, you know, your finances kind of need to be open with each other mm-hmm. if they're not already, <laughs> you know? So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, I think it felt weird. <laughs> it, it is weird. And, um, I think it, it becomes even weirder when you come into a situation or a relationship with your finances kind of already in place. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's not a first marriage or first, you know, significant relationship, or if you have children from a previous relationship, or student debt or anything like that you're carrying in um, to the relationship in the beginning, it used to be a lot different, right? Like people used to get married right out of high school and they grew their financial situation together. Mm -hmm. And it was very open book kind of thing, or one person took charge of it and the other person was more passive. Mm -hmm. In today's world, when um, both partners are usually working and earning their own income, and a lot of times, you know, people are on their second and third relationships or marriages, um, it's a much, much more complicated. Exactly. So I, I think mean, it, way back when it was that the husband went to work, the wife stayed at home. Now you have women that are far exceeding their, sometimes their spouses or their partners, you know, financial abilities, you know, they're sometimes the breadwinners and carrying it. And so it's no longer how it used to be, you know, like the yeah. mom would, you know, balance the checkbook, but she wasn't bringing home any money, you know, now it's everyone's bringing something to the pos- to the pie, you know, they all have a big piece of the pie. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an emotional issue for people too, because, um, spending habits are personal debt is emotional. Debt is an emotional subject for most people. 
And, um, and so it was like credit and situations like that. And, um, people grew up watching their parents do a specific type of financial arrangement. And that may be what they expect, or it may not have worked out for their parents and they want to do the exact opposite. So it is, yeah, it's a loaded subject. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've seen a lot of different scenarios. I've seen a lot of people do it in different ways that works for them. And I think probably that's our bottom line here is that you have to do what works for you as an individual and also what works for your specific relationship. And, um, and there is no right or wrong way to do it. You just have to figure out what works for you and, um, and make that work. And make the communication there. Cause sometimes you, what works for you may not work for your partner. Yeah. You know, they may want to have a joint bank account and you've, you weren't raised like that. It's not something you're not comfortable <clears> with it. You know, it can get, you know, it can get weird, <laughs> you know? So communication's big. Communication's really big when it comes to finances and like figuring out how you're going to run it. Personally, I, like I said, my husband and I have separate accounts. It's not that we don't like, like we're opposed to the idea of having a joint. I just, I don't feel like either one of us have felt like we've really made so much money. Like that's a prop. Like, you know, I make enough to do, to handle my responsibilities. Him and I had a conversation. This is what I'm in charge of. This is what he's in charge of. And we make sure throughout our individual, you know, employments that we can cover those things and, and, and together it, it works. Um, some people need to be a complete open book with each other and know, you know, what's going on and how much each other has. And they share one checking account, you know, and yeah. that works for people. Like you said, it's just, you have to find out what works for you and, you know, make sure you know what your partner is also looking for. Cause if it's a passive relationship where the person isn't used to speaking up, but it's something like that's important. You want to make sure that you know where they're coming from. Cause like you said, I do a lot of the stuff based on what I saw my parents do. So yeah. that's what I know to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so and I think um, that whatever your situation was in past relationships, if you had past relationships, what you, you carry that forward and that creates um, uh, issues within your new relationship, whether, you know, fin financially, there are obviously all kinds of baggage, <laughs> emotional, and physical, but we're talking just today about financial I know um, my partner went through a very, um, in you know, messy divorce process um, in his first relationship, and uh, he had been the breadwinner of the family and the earner, but um, had no um, information or control over his finances. That was handled by his um, ex partner, and so he, when he went through that divorce and didn't know even, you know, really, they didn't, he didn't even know where they banked. That was how unaware of the finances situation he was. Um, it made him realize he wanted to take a, a much more active role in his own finances. And um, he's much more protective of them now. And his personal finances are his personal finances, which I totally respect because I can understand that was traumatic for him. And my previous relationship, I did all the finances and um, my ex-partner hadn't really didn't care, didn't want to be aware of it, didn't, you know, wasn't worried about how we budgeted for things. So um, I'm kind of used to being in more control of the finances. And as our relationship together has progressed, I've taken more and more ownership and control over household finances, bill payment, investments, things like that. You know, but initially yeah. it was like, I was, I was burned by this situation. Mm -hmm. I need to feel like I have, I, I'm going to learn from this. But then he realized that not everybody is going to treat that situation the same and that you're actually fully capable. But yeah. The had to come, right? Right. And I mean, I think it, as, a, as our relationship has grown and matured and progressed, so has the roles within the finances. And for me, because um, my partner is still like the primary breadwinner of, of our blended family, um, and has a complicated financial situation, my kind of way to contribute is by handling a lot of the financial stuff that was previously handled by accountants, because I mean, I'm saving that money and I'm helping him make good decisions. I'm, I'm catching mistakes all the time on credit card bills and things like that. So it is a small way in which I feel like I contribute to the household finances beyond like contributing my own. And then, you know, we both came into our relationship with children from a pre from previous marriages. So that makes the thing even more complicated because um, what he does for his biological children may not be what I do for my biological children financially. 
And so that's a very individual decision that each parent has to make of how, how long they're going to support their adult children and how much, in what ways. Um, if you have elderly relatives, how much support are you going to provide there? Um, if you have family members who ask for loans, um, is that something you guys are going to discuss as a couple or is that an individual decision? So there's a, it's a very layered, very complicated um, thing. Finances are very complicated. So I also came into our relationship with um, much, he's, he's never held debt. He's not comfortable with debt. Um, he came from a country where the government collapsed. So the idea of taking on debt to him is it makes, it's a very unstable situation. Um, so I came into the situation with, you know, I already had kids like getting older where they were needing college and there's student loan co-signing and things like that. So there's a significant amount of debt that goes along with that. And it's there, you know, my kids from previous relationships. So that makes things kind of complicated too, because, um, when you start combining your finances and, and mixing things up like that, it's, it's, uh, it's a different situation than when you come into a relationship, you know, young and, um, and free of, you know, any obligations or encumbrances like that. Yeah. I think that makes a big difference as people decide how to handle their finances. No. Would you ever suggest having a convert? Did you have, or did you ever have a conversation with your adult children about finances, like giving them tips on how they should handle it, especially when they come? I know a couple of your kids, maybe all of them, I don't know, are in serious relationships and how they're handling it. Yes. Forward. Because we are no longer, like we said, in those days where it's like traditionally how things are handled. Um, you know, and even though it is individual children, especially adult children look to us for advice on how to, so would you have any advice on people who have adult children or type teenage children on how to bring up finances in a way where it's beneficial? Yes. Um, that has been something that I had to have a lot of conversations with my kids about during their childhood, middle school, high school age, because, um, I raised them when they were very small in accordance with my financial situation at the time, single mom, I was working, you know, a job where I was well compensated, but it was not the level of opulence that, you know, uh, we benefit from today when I moved in with my partner, which I mean, was years ago, but not decades ago. Mm -hmm. So my kids were of an age where they were very aware of their surroundings, the house they lived in, the kind of cars we drove, the trips we took, that kind of thing. And it was a very abrupt change. Um, we, we lived in a, you know, beautiful community and we were very privileged, but, um, this is a different level than they were used to. And, um, it did happen kind of progressively. It wasn't like overnight, but it, it was a big, <laughs> it wasn't like that Richie rich story where they moved in from this. No. Like, <laughs> it wasn't like Beverly Hillbillies with the, <laughs> it's a truck full of junk, but it was a big difference. And so I did have to have a lot of conversations about, yes, you know, now we live in this particular house and that's, you know, we're very blessed to be doing that, but, um, you know, this is, a, this is his, he had this house before us. This is, you know, his financial situation. Um, and I, I, I really talk openly with my kids. I don't mince words and we joke around. I mean, my kids are my best friends. So I would tell them even when they were like in middle school or high school, like, um, you know, Alex's financial position may be this, but, but we are, are not that. No, <laughs> so, that's, that's a very so adjust, reminder. Yeah. <laughs> adjust your expectations because friends would see the house that they live in and stuff. And then say, why are you driving a used car? Like, why are you uh, this or that? And why are you paying for your own college? Like those kind of things. And, um, so it had to be con communicated because I also told them that, you know, not that I can't afford you to buy a nicer car, but I bought you, you know, I think a for their boy's first car, you know, was a used Hyundai, right? Hyundai accent or whatever. And I told them, you know, one day when you graduate college and you get your first like grown up job and you want to buy yourself a car, I don't want it to be a big step down from what you have. Mm -hmm. Um, because I want you to be proud of what you've accomplished on your own. And mm -hmm. the first car that you can buy for yourself, I want you to be proud of it. And if all I do is buy you brand new Range Rovers or whatever, and then when you go to buy your first car, it has to be something like Hyundai accent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want it to feel like a letdown because that should be a moment of monumentous pride. So it's same thing. When you get your first apartment, it might be like, you know, not the best apartment, but you did it on your own. And I want you to be really proud of it. And it's harder when you come from you know, privilege, like extreme privilege to be Everything happy. Everything else is like a 
big step down when yes. really in real, I mean, it's the lens that you're looking through, right? Right. Um, and you're dealing with the cards you've been dealt with. But at the same time, when you have this mixed card think situation where you're like, we weren't born into it. Cause I always remember, I was so proud. You were always just like, I want to always feel like I could be in a two bedroom apartment and live, drive a car. Like, I don't need any, like I can take care of myself and my kids and I will be fine. This does not make us. Yeah. It doesn't define us. Defy, but this is not who we are. This does not, this does not, this is not my DNA. Like, you know, right. it doesn't, it doesn't define us to the point where, me. um, I, it's a requirement like genuine about yeah. that. Like it was, I, it was a very like throughout and I've known you forever, like a very always, you know, no matter how privileged your life seemed to be, it never, you would always made it sure it never defined you or your children. And they were aware of that too. And that it, you know, You'd be well, I don't out every any of it, you know. Yeah, I don't look around at my surroundings and think that if I had less than this, I would be disappointed because um my my I was raised by a single dad, right? My dad always taught me that you need to be able to row your own boat. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to be a passenger if that's the choice that you make, but you have to be capable of rowing your own boat. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not and you're you're a passenger who literally cannot row, um, it's a very vulnerable situation to be in as a woman. And it's, it's you a literally scary place. passenger too. Cause even when things are like smooth sailing, you're like, what can I do? What, yeah. can I, what can I get my hands on? Because you're always trying and you're an entrepreneur by heart, but you're always trying to self-create something that benefits the world, but also brings home something because you like to be in charge of yourself and feel like you're not a forever passenger, you know, right. like that, that has never left you, you know, right. no matter how you could be completely fine for life and beyond. And you'd still want to be active. I'd feel and still want to be yeah. creative and, and providing somehow. I like to be productive yeah. for sure. But I, <laughs> and I, I'm not, I don't like to have a lot of idle time, but also, you know, my dad also taught me about the need for what, he, what we've always referred to as a fuck you fund. I think we might've talked about it on the mm -hmm. podcast in the past. Um, you never know what your situation is going to be. If you end up in a, in a relationship that becomes toxic for you or a housing situation that becomes toxic, a job that becomes toxic. By a car. Like you never know what it's yeah. going to happen. You need to have that. I you need to have that it, so. money set aside. That's that acts accessible only by you, where if you needed to leave a situation for your own physical safety, mental safety, emotional safety, you, you know, you can make that decision. Because my dad always told me, I never want you to be somewhere and not have the ability to get yourself out of that situation. So he taught me things, even less something as simple as like You're how to drive good. a, how to and drive a stick some shift. Some people are raising eyebrows like, dang, like he raising you like, <laughs> like thug real fast. But no, I mean, those are really important things. You right. never talk about it because it's too adult. Un my parents never talked to me about finances. I got access to my bank account at 18 and I went to the mall and I spent that sucker like it was the apocalypse. And then I had bills to pay and 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 then I and I'm still learning the proper way to save. I still don't save very well. I'm terrible at finances. I'm so immature at finances it pains me. And it's because I'm sorry. My mom and dad never really taught me about finances and I'm not blaming them, but if you don't have those semi-adult conversations on like your dad did, like you had with your kids, then they're just going to go out into the world completely naive to it and think that it's like all going to work out. You know, I was raised yeah. in Orange County with a bank account and no, like nobody watching me. I was like, whatever, I'll figure it out. Like, no. And I, and I dropped out of college because like, I'll figure it out. There was no plan set in place. So the more you talk about your kids, you know, maybe not when they're four, but when they're maybe when they're four, there's so many great ways to teach kids about saving and finances and stuff like that. When they're four, like those cool mechanical piggy banks, like you can teach the importance of saving so early that, you know, they're not completely unaware of how to do it when they have to go out into the real world, or if they enter a relationship with someone like me, who's super financially immature, you don't want two financially immature people trying to pay rent. That's awful. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm luckily, luckily I was matched with someone who's very financially immature and handles most of like, not, he doesn't handle financially the bills, but he lays it out and goes, this is what we need to do. This is how much you pay. This is how much I, like he's, I rely on him because I'm unfortunately very financially immature. And I never really took the time to sit down and say, this is what I need to do. And here I am like a real adult. And now I need to really do it. So 
I really want to teach my girls something along those lines so that they don't make the same mistakes that I did. Um, because we were, we were, we had to work for our money. I had to work. I made, I got allowance, you know, I got my first job when I was 15 and a half. I've always worked, but I don't really have that savings ability. Um, you know, and so if I were to enter a, a new relationship with someone right now, they wouldn't be too jazzed, you know, it would be like, ah, you keep your side. We'll join together later, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, and I mean, I think that's true for a lot of people. People yeah, have made okay. financial mistakes. Maybe they have a lot of credit card debt or they filed bankruptcy in yeah. the past. Whatever the situation is, when you come into a relationship and you have to, and you're having those difficult conversations about finances, um, that's something someone who's been financially responsible from day one would be really concerned to hear about because, mm -hmm. um, it does affect them too. Yeah. So I think you have to have these conversations early. I mean, I did with my kids and I would tell them even when they wanted something, um, I would tell them, you know, it was something maybe that no ordinarily I would just, they asked for it. I would just buy it instead of doing that. I would, I would give them the actual money for it. And then they would have to make the decision if they wanted to spend the money when it was in their hand for the thing they thought they wanted, or if they, once they had the money in their hand, they realized that they would rather spend it on other things or they, a lot of times I would tell them, okay, I'm going to give you the money and you buy this thing, but I'm just telling you, if it was me, I wouldn't do it because the toy looks like it's going to break in about two minutes. <laughs> That's but if you really, if you just still decide you really want it, go, here's the money. But it's, it feels different when someone hands you the thing that you asked you know, for what age versus because I a thousand percent know if I were to give my four-year-old this, she'd be like, yes, let's do it. She's bought the most ridiculous <laughs> stuff. And I've tried to tell her like, girl, you have this, you have five of these. She's like, no, if I were to give her the money, it would just be like, here, this is even more fun. Yeah. So, but that's too little to understand my nine-year-old. She would be like, oh, but I really want that laptop. Maybe I'll save up. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. feel like that would work for that age for sure. And it will cause them to stop and think about how much the value of the the bill or whatever you're giving them where, how far it could go elsewhere or what am I wanting in the future? Or do I really need this? Or is it worth it? Like, that's a really mm -hmm. cool idea to do. <laughs> and when they, when my daughters got to be older and they wanted like designer stuff, um, I would say, okay, you know, this holiday is coming up. If you really want that thing, you I'll give you the money to get it. I'll give you the money for how much it costs in the store. And then what I want you to do is to try to see if you can find it somewhere else, less expensive, or maybe once the cash is in your hand, you realize that you, it, you really don't want to spend it on that thing because having cash in your hand feels different. Having to hand over bills to someone for a thing feels different than if someone just gives you the thing as a gift. Oh, but I'm in such a different stage of life right now that like, if I kid you not, if you give me cash, I will spend it on baby wipes and diapers. Like I physically yeah. need someone to buy me the bag because I won't buy myself the bag ever. That's not everyone, but I'm just saying yeah. like, man, but that's give how me cash, I'm going to make a less cool choice. <laughs> but that's know? how, I mean, I taught them what, if they, once they had the cash, then they, that, you know, bag maybe on like uh, the real, real, or one of those consignment yeah. shop sites looked a whole lot better because they were going to save, you know, 30, 40% doing that. And then they'd have the extra, there yeah, were a lot of ways up. they're getting, they're getting like, yeah. that's they're making money. better decisions, they're making better, better financial choice there. Yeah. yeah. And how this may be too honest of a question. How are your children, adult children's financial decisions thus far? I mean, they're, some of them are in their mid twenties. Like, yeah. My oldest, I, like, I'm being honest. I'm in my mid thirties. I'm still not doing so hot. So like, you know, if they're doing great, which I'm sure they are, they're very mature individuals, like good for them. Like there's at least four good, good ones out there. <laughs> well, I mean, again, everybody is very individual, right? Yes. My oldest is 27. He's very uncomfortable with debt of any kind. Um, and he, he keeps his expenses really modest. And, um, so that he doesn't it, money stresses him out being in debt, stresses him out, having a high level of bills, stresses him out. He would rather rent a room from someone than have his own place just to cut his bills a little bit. So he, feels a little and less stress. overall pressure of life is yeah. like weighing down. I, I know that and I get that. Yeah. And then my 25 year old, he has um, some pretty heavy student debt. He has heavy student debt because he was on academic probation for a period of time, meaning he didn't qualify for normal financial aid. He had to do private financial aid. Mm -hmm. So the interest rate is much, much higher. Mm -hmm. And he's been paying on it now for about a year and a half, two years. And he's realized he's not even made a dent. 
So I make comments to him about how, you know, the, some of the money he spent on things that were just purely for pleasure over that period of time could have kind of been thrown down at that balance to get it. And he's starting to get it. He just got a very significant hard, raise. Hard at, like, yeah. You know what Dan's parents did was they, they, you don't have to do this, but they took over, they took care of his debt, his student loans. And then he paid them back so that the interest didn't just like accumulate like crazy. Yeah. So um, I, I am paid off, but it was like a, a, a softer fall. Yeah. You know? I, I am helping him with, um, his federal student loans, but these were a direct consequence of, um, of not, yeah. <laughs> it was really like two semesters of school that he decided to mess around and not take seriously. There's only so much you can do there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So he just got a very significant raise at work. And I, he, the day he got the raise, he called me and told me about it. And I told him that is awesome, honey. Um, what I, what I would do if I were you again, not my decision, you're an adult. What I would do if I were you were pretend I didn't get the raise, mm. keep living at the level I was living and throw all that extra money at that debt. And it it could be gone within the next 18 months. So, um, do it one month and you'll feel, you'll keep doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It'll feel good that you made a grown up choice for like two seconds that you want to do it again. Yeah. And then my, my oldest daughter is 23 and she's, um, about to get engaged. She's, um, been with her fiance for a very long time. I think like five or six years now they've lived together, um, for a significant period of that time, probably at least half of that time. Um, but she's very, very independent. She does not share finances with him. His name is not on their lease. He, she, yeah is very much until we are I married Sam when I grow up I'm, I'll say it 50 million times until it happens she's just as like she's a very big feminist she's a boss bitch we she's all a boss bitch yeah like and she's always she's always been very clear about that this is I I am going to go in the, through this world and I'm going to make my mark and I don't need anyone yes so that's <laughs> Sam, Sam very much takes care of, takes care of Sam, which I love about her. And I mean, even her landlord would, would tell her, you know, if someone's living in the unit, their name needs to be on the lease. And she wrote the e email back and said, we are not married and I am not going to have any man ever tell me, get the hell out of my house. So <laughs> just so you know, until we are married, no, my name is on the lease. If he, if we break up, he can go. I mean, she was so I mean, and they, they have, I don't even know as a guest on this podcast once, just so I can ask her uh, so many questions. And I don't even, I don't even think they've ever had an argument. Like they're so well suited to each other. She, it's not like she has an unstable relationship. Their relationship is no. Perfect. And it's not like he's very, very super passive. He would it's, never say that to her in a million years. No, either. like they just, they're, they're great together. <laughs> it works really well. And it, and that's fine, you know, cause he also brings brings stuff to the table. Yes. And he's also need her. They're very financially independently secure and we'll figure that out as they go along. Because yeah. He's a, he's a very responsible guy. He's got a great career. He's a fireman EMT. He's a very stable person. Um, so it, the, but going forward now that they are getting married now, um, the financial situation will be somewhat combined and yeah, I know they're having a, to that, right? Yeah, they are very, she's very open to that. And I know they're having talks about how that will work, um, how they will combine their finances in whatever way they choose to, because he has, um, you know, he, he has, a, a mom, he's a, sing, a single mom, only child. So, um, there are conversations that need to be had about, um, what happens when my mom needs care. Um, yeah, what I haven't even had those conversations with my husband, That's right? What cool. happens if she can't live alone? Um, will she live with us? Will she, we pay for, for her to have help? How does that work? That's a conversation you should have before you get married or Is this a conversation you've had with Sam about a conversation she needs to have. Is she yeah. needs to okay. Cause like, she's, sometimes she's, as a mom, we're like, Oh, maybe they know, you know, but no, how would you, I mean, that this is something that we have to teach our kids that these kind of conversations need to happen on the front end. So, so when that you, you marry, don't have a big mess. Everyone in their family and the older you get, the more of a combined situation that could be. Yeah. Common. I mean, if you, so. if, if my ex-husband was the type of person and I, I mean, he's very family oriented, his family and him are very close and, and they all share everything. Like they help each other out financially on a very regular basis. It's kind of like, what's mine is yours. 
And, um, and that's very different from how I Is that am a cultural thing. It might be a cultural thing. Yeah. Because, you know, like I know, I mean, there are definitely cultures where everyone takes care of every, and it's just so ingrained in that culture. Like I, like, yeah, my, I mean, his, my his friend is married to a Hispanic man and they all take care of each other. Right. His background yeah. is Spanish and Filipino. And those are both very family oriented cultures. That, it could be a cultural thing. Yeah. His brother passed away from cancer, uh, years ago, just after we were divorced. And, um, he, he financially contributed to his hospice care. He has supported his widow since that time. Um, and so and this is draw a strain in a relationship if majorly that's not where you come from, and that's not your cultural background. And you're like, Hey, like, this is our, this is our life that we're yeah. building. And you're literally giving it. And then they look at you like, but this is my brother. And it's like, it could right. You don't say no to family. I mean, when we yeah. lived, when we yeah. were still married and living together, he would open up the house to family members to live with us without even asking me. And, it, um, I understood where it was coming from, but it was uncomfortable for me because my family is not that way. And it took some, it took a lot of, you know, communication and understanding because I, I wasn't used to having this house full of house guests for indeterminate periods of time, like months, sometimes months and months. <laughs> so, this is just, um, yeah, a lot of it is cultural. These conversations need to be had before. If, if you didn't have them before and you're already in the relationship, it is what it is, right? But the sooner you but have them, the better. Never, never too late to, ha to have them because you don't want to wait until the, the, the mother-in-law is like, has nowhere else to go where you're now having this conversation, you know, I right. don't know. It's like, no one wants to have these talks, but they're so important when you're, when you're making this choice of be, being a couple forever. Right. And what if moving in together, if you have kids from previous relationships and those kids are not um, doing well at, you know, adulting or are having struggles, um, are, are they allowed to move back into the house? Yeah. It, are they, are you going to financially support them? And if so, to what extent, um, there are things that, you know, can come up in a relationship that you're not expecting as your kids get older, as you guys get older, as your parents get older, um, so there are financial conversations I never expected to have to have with my partner now that I did when my grandmother needed care. Um, she suffered from dementia and she needed full-time care. That was a conversation I would have never even thought to have had because I hadn't been in that situation before. Yeah, sometimes you or, don't have a, a sibling or anyone else to talk to, but you're like, sometimes it's you and like your mom in the world. Yeah. And you or, you know, I, I I had a unique situation where my adult child needed um, a long-term inpatient hospitalization that was only very partially covered, if at all, by insurance. Um, we need, really need to fix this. Mental health is health. Um, anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> but um, that expense was not something I ever in a million years would have guessed would have come up. Yeah. And so I had never had that conversation with my partner, but it was a conversation I needed to have. Be prepared for the unexpected to happen in yes. a relationship. And if you have a very family oriented person that be expected for that to take precedence and be softer to, I don't know. Yeah. I have close, <laughs> I have close friends who, um, have this, the couple I'm referring to have a regular, um, issue, major issue in their relationship about finances. And the issue is not how they together split finances because they were both extremely successful people. The issue is, um, how they support or do not support their adult children. Mm, so one partner has adult children who are highly functioning adults and have careers and are doing great. And, um, and the things that he helps them with is like home purchases or, um, you know, those things that are like big investments. Yeah. Um, where you would, if you were like killing it everywhere else in life, it's, I mean, as parents that will, those things are, those things are great to be a, a part yeah, of. If you're that's able, that's a big part of their, that's a big, I think my parents had their parents help co-sign like with their house, like yeah. <laughs> try not yeah. having your parents help in that moment. Right. If you, if you have the ability to gift your children a house or the a down payment for a house, that's a, that's a Smart. huge privilege. Yeah. Great. Um, but the partner of that person has children who are not doing at the same level of adulting and, um, and helps them regularly with just monthly expenses and that has been a, um, a serious issue in their relationship. And, um, 
and so I, I know that they've tried to navigate that, but it's, it's just kind of a point of contention. And I think that happens a lot for relationships. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Especially when you're in a relationship as a, say you're an empty nester and you're, uh, you know, adult children have left and you're now joining an, a new partner, you know, and there have, I mean, I still ask for help sometimes, but it's just because things are tricky right now, but I'm aiming to not do it, you know, but some, some adult children are like, oh, I know if I can't mom and dad will help me. And I think subconsciously the partner knows that they're not doing their very best to try and get out of that situation of like constantly needing that help. You know, they're just relying on it and mooching a little bit. And that can cause a real strain. Cause it's like, they're not making a valiant effort to not rely on you anymore. Like they're not even like you, they just know that you'll say yes. Right. Yeah. Or if you have a child who has substance abuse issues yeah. or mental health issues and your partner may not be understanding of that because they've never gone through it. Mm-hmm. Um, or they may have a different viewpoint as far as like tough love versus support. How you should handle it. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm from myself and a lot of my friends, what I have found works the best is um, to, for the, both partners to maintain separate um, private accounts and then um, to have either a a household credit card, which is used for all household expenses or a household account, which is used to pay all expenses. And then, um, and each partner contributes to that household account at a scale that is equivalent to wherever their financial situation is. Because another major issue is that a lot of times um, the partners do not make the same level of income. You could have a very, uh, maybe, maybe you took time off to raise your kids. Maybe you work in, you know, social services or a teacher or something where your income is kind of at a set level and your partner um, maybe works on commission or something where the income is, is uncapped. So those are, those are major, major no, stumbling this is blocks going to be my life. Like I'm hoping Dan's new job will, will provide him a much higher income than he's used to. And that's all commission based. And that's all what, you know, based on what he does. Um, I'm, I'm at home watching both the kids all day while he's doing that. There's only so much, even if at like Avengers superhuman level, I can do in a month financially to c- contribute. So I love the fact that we're having this conversation simply because I think I've learned a lot because now I love this idea of having that household expenses credit card. And there should be a set idea because like, say he can contribute eight grand and I can only contribute $800. Well, that should have a conversation because I'm never going to match that, you know, but that should be like, there should be an area where we can both dive in and get, you know, shared needs that. Yeah. And I, I think you just have to spell it out ahead of time. Um, what the housing is going to be, um, who's going to pay for things like when you're traveling or going out to eat. I think it makes sense for everything to be paid out of that household account for stuff like that. And then, Mm -hmm. um, and for you guys to, to contribute equivalent to your income. Um, and, and if, if no one has any kind of resentment or anything about that, that allows that personal account for things. I mean, I have the same situation. I have a personal account that's just for me. And, um, my partner doesn't see the statements for it. Doesn't even ask. So there's no comments about, Oh, you know, you're buying a lot of fast food or takeout or yeah, or like, get, like I said, yeah, awkward when I had or, to get my statements, when we moved, I was like, he's going to know how many like smoothies I buy or how something. many times you went to Starbucks this month or like, uh-huh. does, yeah, it's going to get bad. Yeah. Or because then they're how, like, you say you can only make this much and contribute this much, but are these needs? Like it can get really dicey and weird. Mm-hmm. You know? Who wants to explain why their mocha is like a necessity to life, you know, when you don't feel the same way about a mocha, like, and these are hence why so many fights and so yeah, many or happen if with one of my Exactly. If one of my kids comes, it's what that means. What's it means in a larger picture. If one of my kids comes to me and says, mom, I got a, I got a ticket. I can't afford it. Can you help me out? And I send them money that month. I don't want to have to explain. I don't even mention it. It's not anybody's business. Or if, you know, I don't want to hear like, does it really, do you have to get your nails done that much? Cause it's really pricey. Like this is my fun money, my spending money that I do with what I want. I pay my own bills that are my obligation out of that. I choose to cover my adult children's cell phone plan. I choose to cover their car insurance. That's my choice. 
We're and adults. I, we know going in that this is this is what I'm choosing to do with the money I make. Right. And I don't need to explain it to anyone, whatever that is. You know, you could be donating to the wildlife fund every month. You don't have to explain it to anyone. You and really I, love flamingos. It's your right. Thing. It's, it's your business. That's your choice. You go hard. You work hard for your money, and you don't have to. Even though you're married to someone, that still doesn't give you this obligation to have to share every piece of your life with them. You know. Right. And I would really. I would really strongly encourage even women who are homemakers, who stay home, take care of the house, take care of the kids. Maybe you've never worked. Um, it it's dim, in my mind. Okay. You could feel totally different about this. This is my opinion, please. Opinion. <laughs> um, I find it demeaning to have to ask my partner for an allowance. Yeah. Um, I would rather have that conversation one time in the very beginning and have that money like be auto transferred to me every month into my own personal bank account. So I spend how I choose, whatever the amount is. I have a close friend. This is a perfect scenario. I have a close friend. Um, her and her husband are close friends of my partner and I, her husband is very successful. She was working in this, in this uh, education industry in, for the school district for many years. She, uh, her, her husband said, you know what? I really want to travel a lot. I want to do these things that your job isn't allowing you to do. I'd like you to leave your job. And she spent some time thinking about it. And she said, you know what? Okay. I, they have children together as well. They've been married a long time. She said, okay, I'm willing to leave my job there. This is the caveat. I want you to transfer to me once a year, every month, whatever, what my salary is now. And what it would be as, as I would have grown, grown in my career. Oh, she's so, a boss bitch. Yeah. I so, like that idea. I mean, her, her income, her salary was literally a small, small percentage of what his is because yeah. he's wildly successful. But immensely. So, and that was her contribution. She, to this was her career she was giving up and she, I mean, it wasn't a joke to her. So he did, he does that every month. He gives her the equivalent of what she would have been making if she had stayed in her career. And she stays in touch with the people she worked with to know what they are earning so that it stays fair. And she spends that money the way she spent it before on, on her own personal maintenance, on things, special things she wants to do for the kids, um, think, going out with her girlfriends, things that she doesn't want to have to ask him for money for their living expenses. He covers the travel and stuff like that. He covers out of their household income. But this to her, you should never she, like, I don't have to ask him, oh, can you cover my nails this week? Or no, not, it's like, I would have done this had I had not left. Right. Oh, oh man. She's got, oh. it's, it's people in I my, admire in this world. <laughs> like, that is, but she was okay, sacrificing. I mean, great. she was, she was giving up the career that meant a lot to her in order for them to be able to do the things that he had worked so hard for them to be able to do. And it makes to me perfect sense. And this is such a, a minor amount to him that it, it doesn't matter at all to him, but she, you know, if she wants to buy herself something at Nordstrom, she, she, that's what that money is for. She doesn't have to contribute it back to household expenses. And that worked for them. Mm -hmm. Every person it and every relationship is very different. For you. I, I know a couple who like, ever since they've been, they were together have had, they have, they have that big whiteboard where all of like rent water, like, and everything is like so calculated and they thrive on it. And like every other week they get together and have financial talks and they're so successful. They went from condo to purchasing their own home in California in no time. Cause I'm they were very financially, um, in sync with each other. And they were also open with the communication. I don't want to say that, Oh, open communication is the, the key to it working, but I keep hearing a, like a pattern and all these stories of success where it's like the more open you are, the more successful you'll be because then there's no, um, there's no room for like, I don't know. But I also think that it's also very important to have your own personal account where yeah, it is for you too. And uh, I, I, I remember when I was growing up, my father had gotten divorced, um, not from my mother, from a step mother. And then, um, shortly afterwards had remarried. And I remember hearing as, as a little kid, I was probably like 12, maybe 13. I remember hearing them fighting about how his alimony payment to his ex-wife was coming out of their, their combined account and seeing that having her, part of her deposit into that account, go to pay alimony from some other woman that he had been married to before was a real issue for their relationship. Uh, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But a lot of times, I mean, 
if you guys, if you're in a relationship where it's a blended family or you're coming in as a second marriage, third marriage, he, your partner, either one could be paying child support, spousal support, um, all kinds of issues like that, that if you don't have your own two separate accounts besides the household bills, seeing that even just seeing it every month is, is kind of like having a rock in your shoe or something for some people like, like they, that, yeah, like, it's, it, 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 if it's not your responsibility and you're paying for it, um, it can cause some serious problems. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also think that having the two separate accounts and then having one shared account, um, and having the privacy of having your own account, it, it removes one of the biggest issues in, in marriages that I've heard of it, which is what they call financial infidelity. Um, because you do have your privacy, um, but financial infidelity, if, when someone takes out debt, uh, without telling the other person, when someone spends their kids' college accounts without telling their partner, there's a, you could have a gambling issue. You could have yeah. like, other stuff going on over when that, when, spending. when Helms's character was like taking out money and he was like thinking, Oh, my wife's going to kill me. Like you never want, that feels like you got cheated on. Like you feel lied to, you feel deceived in like such a way that almost like you got cheated on. So that's a perfect way to describe that. Yeah, it, it is. Or, you know, if you have one account that you're sharing and your spouse gets a raise and doesn't tell you about it and is siphoning off that money for their own personal reasons, the, the two separate accounts really solves this issue yes, because then, of that. yes, majorly. And I think it's really important because it does feel like a betrayal. The financial stuff can feel like a betrayal. Um, even though my partner and I have two separate financial situations, and we have one shared household um, account. If I'm going to spend, I, I have free reign to spend on myself, whatever I choose, that's our relationship. But we have had from the beginning an agreement and he follows it, even though he doesn't need to, because this is the money he's earning. He really doesn't owe me this. But if, if either one of us is going to spend over a set amount on an item that we want, um, and we, we both agree to that set amount, we let the other person know. If I say, Hey, honey, I just ordered something. I just ordered a new bag. I really wanted it. Um, he, he has no issue with that, but it's just the honesty of telling him that that a, a specific chunk of money is going to that thing. Um, it has kind of created communication within the two of us. And, um, and I think having something like that, where even if you have separate accounts, say set amount, say, if you're going to spend over, I don't know, $1,500 on something, you let the other person know. Oh yeah. Um, it's a big purchase and it's not talked about. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that you probably do that because you know how big trust in finances is for him. And whether you do it 50 billion times, you're as, as long as you're in the relationship because of how bad of a past he's gotten burned, like how bad of a a past relationship he was burned from, you're always going to be showing him that you're one to be trusted with when it comes to finances. So if you yeah. were just go buy a $10,000 purse and not tell him, even though that's okay, I think a part of his brain would be triggered from that past trauma of like, wow, she's recklessly spending money and not informing me. I feel a little deceived, you know? So well, and, you're also and, aware of where he comes from and wanting to be respectful of that. Yeah. And for me, um, since our financial situations were so different for so long during our relationship, um, it was hard for me if he was going to come and say, Hey, I'm going to buy this boat and I'm struggling to pay for my kids braces this month. Um, mm -hmm. that, that was an issue, not that he owed me that, not that that was his responsibility to pay for that, but, um, mentally it's hard to be struggling and have the person that you love and who loves you be free spending willy nilly. Um, it's Which hard. They have a right to, but they have a right to, but it doesn't it's make like, it. It's like that, like we know better, but it doesn't matter thing. You know? Yeah. Like, it's head and heart thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it it's, and again, they're not his, my kids are not his responsibility. And it's not that I would want him to pay for their braces or whatever it was, but it was, um, it's just like having some, having some emotional sensitivity to your partner and understanding, um, whatever their particular situation is. I, I know a lot of couples who, um, you know, one works in like social services or social worker type work, which is low paid. Unfortunately, it shouldn't be that way, but 
and the partner works a much, much higher paying job. Um, and so it can be hard sometimes when, you know, you're struggling with financial issues and your partner is, you know, not, uh, it can be hard to navigate. So again, communication, communication is so incredibly key. If you guys on what you, what your expectations are, because absolutely. it's not open communication on everything you have. Cause like we talked about the importance of having your own private account that is only available to you and only accessible to you is also important. And somebody may find out that you have one and go, why do you need that? Why do I have to explain why I, why I need that? You know, yeah. so yeah. communication on where you stand with your finances, where you stand with being in a relationship with your finances, this, because we all are, have the right. To, we all come into a relationship with our own personal expectations of how we want to be treated and how we want to go into that relationship. And there are certain things like finances, religion, that you really shouldn't have to feel like you need to um, dim your sparkle, so to say, for. Like yeah. you have a right to privacy or you have a right to open communication. But if you don't speak your truth to your partner in a way where it's set in stone, um, it, it can get dicey. You don't want to wait for that situation to come up to have that conversation because it's already heated. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you don't want to wait to find out that you, your partner has been, you know, secretly supporting his, you know, gambling addiction, addicted brother on the side for six months and you're heated to have that conversation. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't yeah. know when's the best time, but it's not when the, when the confrontations come up to have them, you know? Right. And I, I think that just as important as having an account to pay your mutual household bills out of and exciting ahead of time, the ratio that you're going to contribute to it. I think you also need to use that account for shared financial goals, because um, if you guys have a specific goal, maybe you guys are saving for a house and you've talked about how you want to buy a house and you're kind of, but you don't have a specific plan. And he's doing exactly what you just said, supporting some other relative or buying a boat, whatever it is. And you're like, Hey, I thought we were saving to buy a house, yeah, but you chipping away at your future, right? but you haven't been specific about it. You haven't said, okay, we're saving for a house. That means every month in this household account, we're, we're going to try to contribute a total of this much, this much from you, this much for me. And that we won't touch. That will be for a house. Or it could be a trip to Disney. It could be yeah. um, I, I, anything. I've worked in a bank before. There are accounts where you can literally put money in automatically and literally cannot touch it no matter what for three years, five years, six months. You can put a, it's called CDC. Yeah. You can put timeframes on it and you can make sure that partner, when you guys talked about the house is putting and contributing towards that. So if they want to use their Starbucks money to help their brother, that's their choice, but it's also not ripping away at your future. Cause then- right. You know, yeah. or if you, if you guys decide you're going to contribute, you're going to max out your 401k contr contributions, whatever the goal is that you're saving for having it be scheduled and having it be agreed upon. And then if they do want to do something of their own on the side that to you is not important is frivolous can wait. Um, th that's fine. That's their yeah. choice because they've contributed what you guys agreed on. So I, again, communication is so important. Think of how many women wouldn't have to hide their Amazon packages from their partner if they're just had open communication. <laughs> I yeah. see so many funny TikToks of like moms, like, or who, women like go away, Amazon driver, like hiding them because they don't want their spouse to know what they're buying or that they're spending a ton during the pandemic. It's like, I, I was like that, but my, my husband's never asked me or questioned it because I take care of my stuff. And yeah. he knows that I'm not in debt, um, or at least he hopes I'm not in debt, you know, <laughs> like he knows that I'm financially secure to where I, my, my purchases don't get ridiculed, but sometimes people feel like they have to hide their purchases. Like you can buy that weird thing on Amazon because you work 40 hours a week, as long as you're not, you know, as long as you're taking care of the household contr contribution and it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you can, you yeah, can I, that's a but as long as it's not putting something else in debt or you're not being shady about something else somewhere else, because that's where the relationship. Right. And that's where it becomes, you know, borderline infidelity and in a relationship, yeah. financial infidelity. Like, it's, or like, just like any type of real big deception like that feels like that. Yeah. Infidelity. Well, I mean, I would live by the rule. If, the, if you have something going on in your life that you feel like you can't tell your partner, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> That's just my opinion. It's kind I of mean, how I gauge. How far things. does that go? Because like, like I said, Starbucks and I are really good friends and I add those up and I'm like, dang, like I know how much that is 
Like, you know yeah. what I mean? No, I know. Not everything, but like, <laughs> I don't want to tell him how many times I hit the drive through, but at the same time, maybe that's the, maybe that's the voice I should be listening to. If you can't tell your spouse it, then maybe you need to like check it or see yeah. if that's really something you should be doing. But yeah, this was another heavy topic, but I feel like something that's very, I learned a lot and I feel like in this day and age where everyone can be a millionaire in a matter of like, you, I know so many entrepreneurs that not personally, but I know so many people that are young and, and think of something cool, invent an app and come into money really fast. And they have no idea how to invest it or what to do with it. I feel like this is a great conversation to have with people like kids, kids, my oldest and all the way up to kids your age, because that's when you really start to make those decisions. Um, and sometimes they can happen almost overnight nowadays. You don't have to go work for 40 years to have a good, good, good yeah, money. That's you know? very true. You can and I, I, good money real fast nowadays, you know? Yeah, you can. It's crazy. I would encourage anybody who's going into a, um, a serious relationship and has kids from a previous marriage, has debt from previous situations, or has significant assets that they are bringing into the relationship. Um, I know it's not romantic. I, I get that, but it, it it's smart for, for women particularly, but for everyone, um, you really need to consider having a relationship agreement, a legal relationship agreement. If you're not married or having a prenuptial agreement, if you didn't do that, but now it's becoming an issue. There are such things as you post don't know who people are when no, you they, don't, when they have her taking you to court. I personally, when I lost my mom, I, I came into a good chunk of money and I didn't do anything with it to protect just me because I trust my husband. But what if we go to court and he does something real shady and tries to get half of my mom's money that he didn't do anything for. And I have no way to protect myself. You yeah. Know? If you, if you've already, if you already are married and you didn't do that, and now you're realizing you should have, I'm just there, are, <laughs> Don't there, <be> are, <laughs> there are such things as a post nuptial agreement where oh. you can, um, it's like a prenup, but you do it afterwards. You both agree, you sign it, it's a legal document. It protects assets that you brought into the relationship. It protects assets or if you're building your own business and you want to protect that separately from your marriage, um, you have the right to do that. If you want to leave your adult children specific things um, out of your estate and you don't want there to be any conflict between your spouse and those adult children, have it all be in writing, create a trust, create a post-nuptial agreement, whatever you need to do. Because uh, the last thing that any of us wants is for a situation to go bad but sometimes it does, no matter how hard you try, no matter how good people you are, sometimes crazy things happen and people do crazy things. And when it comes to money, people do really crazy things. My mom um, didn't have a lot of money, but she had a big house and she had no life insurance, no will, no nothing in writing. And it literally tore my family apart for years because it was all, we, everybody was trying to do the right thing by my mom, but she didn't have it laid out. And so it was just, it was a mess and it can tear people apart. You know, you have people, you know, like saying that they own things all of a sudden that they don't because things come out when those moments happen. So the yeah. more prepared you are, the more open in communication you are, the more educated you are, anything you feel unsure of, like there's probably something to protect you. I just said out loud, I don't feel like I have any way to protect myself or my mom's money from my husband. And you said that there is a way mm -hmm. I've done zero research. I just assumed there was no way. So there goes to show you that if you do your research and you educate yourself, there's a lot of ways to protect you. Um, because like I said, the way people make money and how they handle their money within relationships has evolved so much since right. You, yeah. If you have money, maybe that you inherited before or during your marriage, and you want that to go directly to your kids and you, you'd want it to be really clear, um, set up a trust and, and have it all written out that way. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, like I, I will be leaving my children a significant amount of money and I want to protect that money from, it's not that I don't love their spouses. <laughs> like I really do, yeah, but, but, um, but I want to make sure you're not their mother. That's right. not, that's not, and their if mother. their relationship was to go ugly and get divorced, break up, whatever, I want to make sure that my children's um, assets that I leave them benefit my children alone. So exactly that will, what I feel like my mom would have said, and I yeah. feel like every mom agrees to that statement and there's ways to protect yourself. So just make sure you do that. <laughs> you yeah. know, make sure you do that. I, I mean, I'm all for, for newly married couples, building 
their nest egg together, building things together, but you, you have to protect yourself. And if you're getting into a relationship and you are not the earner in the relationship, it's even more important to get things in writing because, um, you, you could be in a very vulnerable situation overnight. You never know people. You never know what people are capable of and people change. And so, you know, you can only trust yourself. I don't mean yeah. to be like, oh, so dark, but really you, you don't know what anyone's capable of. Like I, people who were the most in love have had the ugliest, ugliest divorces. Cause you just don't know what someone's capable of until they're backed into a corner until money's presented in front of them. Or, you know, somebody's spouse is like not doing so well. So all of a sudden the adult kids come out of the, out of the woodwork. It's like mm-hmm. money can bring out some really evil things in people. You want to protect yourself when possible, you know, cause yeah. there are things out there to do so. Right. And it's, not, I, I understand that it's not romantic and nobody wants to imagine <laughs> the end of their relationship, but, um, but we, we need to protect ourselves and we, and, and that goes for men and women. And we need to protect, um, our, our situation. You don't want to end up in a situation where the rug is pulled out from under you. The last thing in the world I would want for anybody, um, is to be in a relationship that they realize no longer works for them or is becoming toxic for them and not have the means to leave. So, um, having things in writing, having your own separate account, um, building that fund, that emergency fund. It's all of this is so, so very important. And, um, thankfully I'm seeing, you know, it seems like at least from my friends and family that, uh, women are becoming much more involved in finances where in the past, you know, they kind of left that up to their husband. So I'd love to see that. I love to see women investing. I love to see women doing their own, um, financial stuff, do their own 401k, their own investing. It's, it's very, very important. So, yeah. and also really capable of doing all these things. We just, you know, are ingrained to think that it's not what we do. Yeah. And I mean, if you're, if you're a stay at home mom, a homemaker, um, I think that's fantastic. Believe me, I know it is the hardest job in the world. Um, but you protect yourself because, uh, you may not know what your options are, Um, you're not contributing to your retirement. You're not contributing to, you know, Medicare and and social security for yourself. And I know a lot of women in their sixties now who were homemakers their whole life and just realized that they don't, they won't get social security and, um, and they're completely reliant on their spouse's pension or, or their social security. So um, I would really strongly, really strongly suggest that, you know, we think about that early. We think about that when we're in our twenties and thirties. And um, we do start IRAs, 401ks. We do um, understand our rights as far as our spouse's pensions or social security goes. And um, we set aside something for our own retirement, even if we never work, because you don't know. I mean, I, I know I have friends who's, whose husbands passed suddenly in their 40s um, and, and they never expected and they, know. they, yeah, you know, it doesn't have to be a relationship issue. Sometimes life can just throw you a really hard curveball, and you know, all of a sudden you're a homemaker with three kids and the breadwinner and your husband is now gone and you can't even grieve properly because you're freaking out about how to, you know, how to support your kids. Yeah. You know, when really you should be just taking care of you and your children at that point, you know, yes. it's so sad and it happens too much. It happens. Yeah. Too I, ha- I have three friends who that exact situation happened to. Yeah. who were stay at home moms and they lost their husbands young and unexpectedly mm-hmm. and had absolutely no idea how they were going to support themselves and their children. Yeah. So and it sucks because we go into fix it mode when really we should like, we just lost our partner unexpectedly. How I like, that's all that we should be focusing on that and the health of uh, the children, you know, and it's just like, now we have to worry about this too. It just, you know, and then, and then you don't want to have to have that self-reflective, like, Oh, maybe I should have done this you know, yeah, that's not the time. The time to think about it is, is before anything happens. So you want to give yourself time to grief hibernate when stuff like that happens. I mean, I know I needed to hibernate for a while when I lose someone. So, um, I think this is such an important topic. I'm so glad that we covered this. And I know there was probably a lot we didn't even touch on <laughs> Talk a whole long time about this. Topic. Right. But the point was mostly to start the conversation, to start the conversation with our listeners and our readers. And um, hopefully for you guys to start the conversations within your relationships. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not an easy conversation to have, but I think it's, you can't put it off any longer. We may think we have, 
you know, forever, but that's not guaranteed. So you may think, you know, someone's finances and then you have that conversation and you go, Oh, okay. Like I need to like, you know, start a personal savings again. Like you just don't want to ever be blindsided. This just prevents it. The blindsided feeling, the infidelity feeling as much as possible. Um, yes. It's a good way. It's a good thing to do. Again, life's not like a fairy tale all the time. It's like not the most romantic thing to talk about, but if you guys are serious about starting a life together and succeeding in that life, you know, especially in certain areas of the United States, it's really hard to succeed in life. It's hard in California to buy a home and, you know, maintain that home. Um, you, uh, you need two working people in, in the house to do it. So the more conversation you have about where you are currently, where you want to go as a couple, then you can actually start to see what is out there in place for you to actually be successful. Because if you just think putting it in like a cute little like mason jar and put house fund, like, yeah. no, because then things are going to come up and it's just going to be taken out of. You need to be, there's better ways to do these things. So, but it all starts with that, that, oh, that conversation about yeah. who I am. This is where I want to go. Um, does this mesh well with you, you know, cause you shouldn't have to get, when it comes to finances, I really don't feel like you should have to co like compensate what your beliefs are on it, you know? Yeah. And I, I like, I have friends who, um, whose husbands passed away or they got divorced and weren't expecting either thing to happen and realized they were, they had mortgages that they didn't know they had. They had, uh, they were deeply in debt. They thought they had a really secure financial situation because yes. they drove nice cars and they had a nice house. And all of it was financed and there was actually no equity in anything. So you don't, you want to know, at least start asking the questions, take yeah. a look at the statements, see where your financial position and is. And if they're hiding information from you, that's not a good, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like start the conversation because you don't ever want to be blindsided by that. It can, it can change your whole life. It, it can will, change your whole life. And it will rip your savings account clean to get, yes. to, to take care of debt. And you will have no idea that was coming. And yeah. it's not even you, it was your spouse. That's no longer around. It's awful. It's awful. So. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, there's a lot of like social media influencers who focus on women's finance. So if you have no idea at all, you don't know anything about money. Um, I would definitely go and look up some of those accounts and follow those people and just start to learn, start to read a little bit on your own about what things are. Um, get familiar, look at your tax. If you don't, touch your tax returns. You just sign wherever your husband tells you or, or your partner tells you to sign, you know, read that stuff Yeah, because there, you never know what's going on. And you, you may wanna... not have that spouse to tell you, you know, next time tax season comes around to guide you through it. You want to be, you want to feel as financially independent as possible, you know, yeah, or you could be hard on one person. It's too. Yeah. Or you could be, um, your own like legal self could be at risk if you're just signing things that you didn't read. So, um, yeah, you know, that's you. <laughs> you <laughs> Very true. You want to make sure that, you know, you're on board with whatever the situation is. And, um, if you're not, and you find this out later, I'm so sorry for you. I know how that feels. It's really awful. Um, there are, you know, the IRS has something called the innocent spouse act. Uh, go look it up. It's amazing. If you find out that, um, things are not being reported properly, um, and have these conversations, have these conversations with your children with your partner. Um, I know finances aren't fun for anyone to talk about, but it's really important. Yeah. It makes our world go around, unfortunately. And if we do it wrong, it could really affect us and your relationship. So yeah, you, you might live to be a hundred. You might need long-term care. You might need, um, a lot of help when you're older, you might have significant medical bills. You need to know where you stand and what you have in place to plan for that, because you don't want to end up, you know, being a burden to the the state. You don't want to be, end up being a burden to your children. Um, so yeah, this is important stuff. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not, <laughs> not a great feel good topic, but fun, uh, important. Yeah. yeah. Watch me not go buy a Starbucks now after this talk. I'm like, well, let's <laughs> just go put it in my CDC account. And <laughs> That's good. No, it's a good thing. It's a good, it's thing. a good thing. Awesome. All right. Well, we will be back next week. If you guys want to um, continue the discussion, please go to our Facebook page. We have a discussion group on there. Again, we really appreciate every single reader, every single listener, um, all of our watchers on YouTube. Please take the time to rate and review us. It really helps with the algorithms and subscribe to our channel. If you haven't already sign up for our newsletter, all that fun stuff. You don't want to miss any of the great topics that we're talking about, and we will see you next week.
Bye. Bye. Welcome to She's a Full-On Monet, a digital lifestyle magazine for women. Every week, our editor-in-chief, Kelly Castillo, along with Megan Block and special guests, participate in a deep dive discussion about recent articles and topics we have covered. We invite you to become part of our community where everyone's welcome.